Thank you uh, very much indeed, Ian. I'm blushing as always. It's a huge honour to get this award. I, I only actually saw David Crichton in person once, but it had an enormous effect on me. So this was many, many years ago when I was a postdoc in the University of Cambridge in 1990, 1991. And it was perhaps a slightly unusual choice for someone who'd just come out of the Oxford Functional Analysis Group to go to a lecture in fluid mechanics. But I did. And David showed us photographs of an experiment involving a rotating cylinder containing a viscous fluid and the vortices forming. And I think this was the first time that I really saw that if you view the world through a mathematical lens, not only can you understand the world a bit better, but also you can uncover beautiful mathematical structures worthy of study in their own right. Now, I'm no David Crichton, so I can't promise you a lecture that you'll remember in 35 years' time. But what I want to tell you a little bit about is what happens when we view patterns of population genetics, patterns of genetic variation in the world around us through a mathematical lens. Okay, now, I don't know quite how this works because I don't have a clicker. Where's my... Ah, you've got my clicker. And how do I get it onto the right set of slides? Just press down. Even better. Okay, so... Um, let's begin. So mathematical population genetics finds its origins in what we call the modern evolutionary synthesis. And that was the period when the theory of, on the one hand, Darwin, on the other hand, Mendel, were united into a common theory. So in case you haven't been reading your origin of the species recently, let me tell you what it was all about. So Darwin tells us that heritable traits that increase reproductive success will become more common in a population. And in order for that to work, you need variation in the population, because if everyone's the same, nothing's going to change. And offspring must be similar to parents. Okay? So then what does Mendel tell us? Well, Mendel tells us that traits are determined by genes. Well, the sort of traits Mendel was interested in were determined by genes. But traits more generally are at least heavily influenced by the genes that we carry. And genes occur in different types, which I'm going to call alleles. And that gives us the variability that Darwin needs. And offspring inherit genes from their parents. So that gives us the heritability that Darwin needs. So put like that, it seems surprising that it took 50 years before people realized that these two theories could be melded into a single theory. But perhaps part of the reason was that Darwin concentrated on natural selection achieve, achieving big changes through the accumulation of lots of small th changes. So the way that the beaks and the Galapagos finches change from being these sort of small beaks to the big beaks was an accumulation of lots of small effects. Whereas Mendel was very interested in discrete changes. So Mendel, uh, I'm very confused because I get the next slide showing and I'm looking at the wrong slide. Um, Mendel was interested in you know, green pea versus yellow pea. That's very discrete, wrinkled versus smooth, and so on. But united they were, and they were united largely, actually, through the theory of mathematics. And the three people who we usually associate with this uh, modern evolutionary synthesis, the names who we consider most important, are J.B.S. Haldane on the bottom left. You will not have trouble guessing that's the Oxford professor. Um, R.A. Fisher, famous statistician on the top left. And Sewell Wright, a very famous American um, evolutionary geneticist on the top right. Now, Wright and Fisher hated one another, which is why there's a big white space in between them on this slide. So although they would certainly have all agreed that the theories of Mendel and Darwin were compatible, what they would have disagreed over, and in some, sense, in some ways rather violently and extremely aggressively in the writings of Fisher, is the answer to this question, which is what's the relative importance of the different forces of evolution that are acting on a population for the patterns of genetic variation that we see in the world around us. So for example, what's the importance of natural selection as opposed to the fact that we live on the surface of the earth, we have a spatial structure, or to genetic drift, which is um, really the, the love child of uh, Sewell Wright here, which is the process, uh, it's the name that we give to the process that's just randomness due to reproduction in a finite population. So we still don't really know the answer, but we think we can make some progress. And why do we suddenly think we can make progress when these extraordinarily smart people couldn't? Well, you'll see that Sewell Wright has a guinea pig in his hand. Now, that wasn't for wiping the board. <laughs> it's actually because he bred guinea pigs. But he could only observe genetic variation, as could all of these guys, indirectly through looking at phenotype. And they have very cute genetic data, 
but it was much less informative than the kind of genetic data that we have today. So whereas they looked indirectly at phenotype, a modern geneticist has data that looks more like this. Not as cute, but it has an awful lot of information in it. So let me tell you what this data is. It's hard to see, but there are 80 horizontal lines here. And they correspond to 40 individuals from the 1000 Genomes Project. And this was 40 individuals from Nigeria, in fact, and two copies of the chromosome for each of them. And what the dots represent are points on the genome at which those individuals differ from one another. And what a modern geneticist does is that they take a sample from a population, they sequence it, and they use those differences, which you can see by who has dots and who doesn't have dots, or who has different colored dots, and they use differences between individuals to infer something about how related they are. How, how far back in time do you trace to their most recent common ancestor, for example? Okay. And we're going to first of all investigate how you might model this in the simplest possible mathematical model. Okay. So here's a very, very simple model of inheritance. And it was introduced by Wright and Fisher independently. And they probably wouldn't be very happy to see their names concatenated, but we always do. And here's how the population evolves. So I want you to think of a population of annual plants, and they're monoecious, which just means that they all bear both, both male and female flowers, because I'm too lazy to think about different sexes. Okay? And the pumpkin is a good example, as it turns out. And it's an annual plant, so it's going to evolve in discrete generations, and each offspring is going to just to choose two parents uniformly at random from the previous population. So I'm ignoring natural selection. I'm assuming all parents are equally fit. I'm ignoring spatial structure. I'm assuming pollinators fly infinitely fast and will uh, pollinate each plant equally likely with the, every other. Okay? And let's draw that in a picture. So what I've done in this picture, I suspect I'm not meant to walk away from the microphone, but I'm going to anyway. Is that okay? Oh, I'm all right. So each of these circles represents an individual, and this is the present-day population. And what I've done is I've drawn two lines that connect each individual to randomly chosen parents in the previous generation. So this is the past as I trace up the, up the page. So I, I got tired, so there's just four generations of ancestry. And what you see is that already four generations ago, there are three individuals. It's slightly hard to see, so I've pointed them out to you. But there are three individuals in that population who are ancestral to everybody. So what I'm going to call the branching and coalescing structure that's traced out by these blue lines, I'm going to call it the pedigree of individuals. So each individual here has a pedigree which traces their parents and their grandparents and so on. And those three individuals sit in the pedigree of everybody in the present day population. Now, it's probably not too surprising if you think that, you know, we all have two parents and four grandparents and eight great grandparents and so on. It's perhaps not too surprising that after, with a probability that tends to one as n tends to infinity, after log to the base two n generations, you expect that there will be one, in fact, with probability one, there will be at least one individual in the ancestral population who is ancestral to everybody alive today. What's perhaps slightly more surprising is a result due to Chang in 1999, which says that if you go back 1.77 log to n generations, so not much longer in some sense, everybody in the ancestral population is ancestral to either everybody today or nobody today. And in fact, about 80% of the ancestral population is in the pedigree of everybody alive today. But as a geneticist, that's not terribly helpful because if I'm interested in a particular gene, I only carry two copies of that gene, so I can only possibly have inherited those two copies of that gene for at most, from at most two individuals in that ancestral population. So the pedigree isn't a very useful object from the perspective of genetics. So we're going to refine our model a bit and think about genes. Okay? So what I didn't tell you was what the small circles inside the big circle represented. So I'm thinking of those small circles as being the two copies of a particular gene. For all of this talk, we're just going to think about a particular gene. And the lines, they weren't just badly drawn from, parent, uh, from offspring to parent. I was actually connecting small circles. So each parent, each offspring, chooses two parents. And this gene was inherited from one of these equally likely. I just picked one of these equally with equal probability. That's Mendelian inheritance. Okay, so the red lines here are just tracing genetic ancestry. So they're just seeing how I can connect a gene in this individual to a gene in its parent, to a gene in its grandparent, and so on, going backwards in time. 
And what you see is that individual in the top right, who is an ancestor in the pedigree to everybody today, hasn't actually managed to transmit any genetic material. Okay? So we're not going to think in pedigrees, we're going to think in genetic ancestry. And that's going to actually make our life much, much easier because each gene has got a unique parent in the previous generation. Okay, so I'm going to throw away the guys that didn't contribute and just look at those unique parents. And now I can really draw the ancestry in the form of a tree. So all I've done is I've labeled the, in the individual genes, one through 10, there are 10 of them, so I've got two in each of five individuals. And this is just unwrapping the trees that are in encoded in that picture and drawing them as planar trees to make them easier to, to parse. But what you can see is that because each gene has a unique parent and then a unique grandparent, the number of ancestral lineages, lineages that I trace can only get smaller as I go backwards in time. So I'm always going to get things that look like trees, and they're much easier than pedigrees to study. Okay? And the other thing to notice is that, let's suppose I, I look at this gene. First of all, we sampled a parent from the five individuals in the previous generation, uniformly at random. And then from within that first parent, I chose a gene uniformly at random doesn't really matter that it was sitting within this plant. What I could equally have done would, was say, well, let's take all these 10 genes and put them in a melting pot and think of this gene as just choosing from that melting pot uniformly at random. Because if I sample a plant and then sample uniformly within the plant, I don't really care about the structure. I'm just sampling uniformly from the 10 uh, genes that are available. And that takes me to the simplest imaginable form of, of uh, model. So the simplest imaginable model of inheritance, also named after Wright and Fisher, is what we call the haploid Wright-Fisher model. And this is just that each offspring, which is now a gene, selects a single parent uniformly at random from the previous generation. And we've already said that if I take a sample from my population, now a sample of genes, their ancestry is going to be in the form of a tree. And actually, it's quite easy to describe that tree. So let's think about that tree in the very simplest case, where I take a sample of size two. So suppose that I sample just two genes from down here, then the only information in the tree is how many generations I trace back until they get to a common ancestor. Okay? Well, the chance they had a common parent is one over two n, where n is the number of plants in my population, so two n is the number of genes. So why is that? Well, the first one chose a parent, and they could have chosen any parent, and the second one's got to choose the same one. So there's only a chance one over two and they do that. If they did choose the same one, the chance they chose a common... The, if they did not choose the same one, I apologise, the chance they chose a common grandparent is one over two n. And again, if they didn't have a common grandparent, great-grandparent, one over two n, and so on. So the number of generations that I go back till I get to the first time they have a common ancestor is as if I'm just rolling a fair two n-sided die and I wait for it to come up with a one. And on the average, that's going to take me two n generations. Okay? So in mathematical language, it's a geometric random variable with parameter 1 over 2n. And if I measure time in units of 2n generations, then as n tends to infinity, I can think of the timed coalescence as being roughly an exponential 1 random variable. Don't worry if you're not comfortable with that. It's a nice random variable. That's all you need to know. OK. But notice that the most recent common ancestor in the pedigree was log 2n generations ago. And now I've just taken two individuals and I've got to trace back 2n generations. And we said that n was very big. So 2n really is massively bigger than log 2n. The timescales of genetics are much, much longer than the timescales of those family trees that you see on you know, stately home walls. Or maybe you have your own up on the wall somewhere at home. Okay. So I just told you about a sample of size 2. In fact, tracing back. Uh, for a larger sample isn't difficult either, and I'm just going to describe it to you rather than derive it. So let's suppose that I take a sample of k individuals from my population. For a very large population anyway, the, the number of generations, if I measure time in units of 2n generations, to make everything order 1, because we've seen that 2n is the right time scale over which to look at uh, genetic evolution, the time I must trace back before anything happens in my genealogical tree is just the minimum of the k choose two different pairs of ancestral lineages that I'm tracing. Um, they've each got an exponential random variable attached to them. I look at the minimum of those k choose two exponential random variables. So that's what we call an exponential with parameter k choose two. So it's a very short time. 
And now I've just got k minus one lineages left, so because a pair of lineages at random will now coalesce into a single lineage, because that pair had a common ancestor. And now I've got k minus one lineages, and I trace back an exponential with parameter k minus one, choose two, until a pair of lineages chosen at random coalesces, and so on. And if I say, cool, this is a sample of size 1,000, and that's what the tree that I trace out looks like. And it's very characteristic. You can see it's very squished at the bottom. And in fact, on average, it will never be more, even as the size of my sample goes to infinity, this tree will never be more than twice as, as big as the tree that we have for just two lineages. So most of the depth of this tree is in the distant ancestry where you've just got the small number of lineages. OK. Um, this is a projection of something that's known as Kingman's coalescent, which Kingman introduced in 1982. And it's really the um, workhorse of statistical genetics. And one of the reasons for that is that for a vast array of mathematical models, as long as the population size is large, and all individuals are equally fit, and I'm allowing spatial structure, but I'm going to sample individuals far enough away from each other that they don't feel that spatial structure too much, then measuring time in suitable units, the genealogy of the sample is going to be of this shape. It's going to look like a Kingman coalescent. So for a huge number of models, that's true. So there's a universality to the Kingman coalescent. But of course, I said that for models, and you'd probably be more comforted if I could say it for a natural population. And let's begin not with a natural population. No natural population is going to evolve according to a right Fisher model. That would be silly. But we can make laboratory populations evolve according to something a bit like a right Fisher model. And an experiment due to Bury in the 1950s did exactly that. Now, Bury was a student of Sewell Wright. And when you've heard what this experiment is, you might understand why he had so few students. So the experiment was as follows. On the top left is Drosophila melanogaster. It's a fruit fly. You've got them in your fruit bowl at home. I, actually, I won't accuse you. I've got them in my fruit bowl at home. <laughs> and Drosophila have a, there's a gene in Drosophila that affects eye color without affecting their fitness. And it comes in two types. And we're just going to call those types little a and capital A. And what Bury did was he took 100 populations of Drosophila and he started them, each of them, from eight males and eight females, each of which was 50% one eye color, 50% the other eye color. And he propagated these populations forward. So after every generation, he measured the proportion of the different colors and he sampled 16 individuals, eight males and eight females, and pr produced the next generation. Now, what the right Fisher model predicts is that if I look at the uh, proportion of individuals of type little a, say, and call it pt after t generations, and I multiply that by the proportion of capital A's, called 1 minus pt, and I calculate the average of that over, over the, my 100 populations, then it should decrease by a factor 1 over n in each generation, where n here is 16. Okay? And so the variability across populations is going to follow a formula like this. Okay? Now, that's just saying eventually every population will be entirely one type with equal probabilities. That's fine. Okay, so here's Bury's data, the circles, Bury's data. And the right Fisher prediction is this one. Not great. On the other hand, this is also a prediction of the right Fisher model. It's just it has a different population size. It has a population size of 11 and a half. So it turns out that if I substitute an effective population size, as we call it, instead of a real population size, it's actually a pretty good fit, because this is not a very big experiment. Okay? It probably felt quite big to Bury. Okay, so that's for a laboratory um, uh, population. But what about real populations? Well, what's astonishing is that actually, for a vast array of naturally occurring populations, <coughs> the same is true. If I look at a gene which doesn't confer any particular selective advantage to its holder, and I sample individuals from uh, far enough away from one another, then the predictions of the right Fisher model are extremely good, provided instead of using the census population size, the real population size, I use an effective population size. And that's all the more surprising when you look at the order of magnitude of difference between census population size and effective population size. So the one that I'll pick out is humans. Census population size, 8 billion. 
Effective population size, well, if you sample from across Europe, about 20,000. If you sample across the whole globe, maybe 50,000. So lots of orders of magnitude difference. And unfortunately, we don't actually know how to calculate NE. We just know that if we fit data, it's always got the tree looks like a Kingman coalescence, and then we can find an NE so that everything matches. We don't know actually how to, how do we feed in natural selection, range expansion, spatial structure, the fact that populations have grown and they've been subject to different climatic conditions and so on. How do we feed all that in? We don't know. We just know that it works. Okay. But we would like to understand a bit better. So what we're going to do now is we're going to refine our model a bit more and put space in. So um, this is a model that goes back to Wright and Malico um, in the 1940s. So same Sewell Wright and Gustav Malico, who as far as I know didn't wage war with, um, uh, with Fisher, but that could be because he published in French. Um, and here is their starting configuration. They start from a population, actually they worked on the whole of two-dimensional space, um, but they start from a population that's just evenly scattered everywhere, okay? And again, the population evolves in discrete generations, but now because it's got a spatial structure and it's scattered over all of space, it, the total population size would typically be infinite, so I can't just, I, I, I can't exactly mimic the right Fisher model. But what we suppose that is in each generation, each individual produces on the average one offspring, a random number of offspring, but with, with mean value one. And they chose it to be Poisson because that's as similar to a right fissure model as you can get. And the offspring are scattered around the position of the parent according to a Gaussian distribution. So just a nice symmetric distribution around the parent. And they believed that if you looked away, if you allowed the population to evolve and then looked back, the picture would look the same that this would be a stationary distribution. And it doesn't seem unreasonable, right? You're replacing roughly one to one, and you're scattering things in a uniform way. Well, based on that assumption, they were able to write down really useful formulae. Things like, if I sample individuals at a separation X, they've got a certain genetic relatedness. There's a correlation in their genetic types. But that's going to decay as I sample from further and further apart. And they were able to write down a formula that captured that decay, a mathematical formula. So remarkably powerful and useful formula. But unfortunately, then along came Felsenstein. And in 1975, Felsenstein observed that actually, oops, their model's not consistent. That if you, t so this is best illustrated through a simulation. This is a simulation, a very old simulation from a lab meeting that Jerome Kelleher produced. So what Jerome did was he simulated obviously on a torus. So he threw a thousand individuals uniformly at random on a torus. And he allowed the population to evolve according to the right Fisher model um, for a number of generations. And after 10 generations, this is what it looked like. So population pretty close to 1,000 still, but it's not really looking as evenly distributed. And after 100 generations, actually population still pretty close to 1,000, but that is not what we started with. Our population is forming clumps. After 1,000 generations, the population has noticed that mathematically it has got to die out in finite time, and it started dying out. And indeed, not long after that, this, um, uh, this particular simulation did indeed run out of individuals. Now, Felsenstein saw this clumping happening on the whole of Euclidean space, and he said, oh, it's probably because I'm working on the whole of Euclidean space. Let's work on a torus. And if you work on a torus, the total population size is what we call a critical branching process. And we know that that is going to die out in a finite time. And we know that it doesn't help to make everyone have slightly more offspring because then the population will blow up. So you, know, you can't just do this with branching processes. And so he said, well, let's exogenously just specify the, the total population. Let's say the population size is fixed at 1,000, for example. But we can see from Jerome's simulations that doesn't help either. We still get this clustering. And at that point, Felsenstein said, OK, I give up. And he declared the problem the pain in the torus <laughs> and uh, wrote a very famous paper. And so the message is that in one and two spatial dimensions, actually Felsenstein thought it was in all dimensions, it's only in one and two, but in one and two spatial dimensions, which are the relevant ones for genetics, the population exhibits this clumping and extinction. And if we're going to overcome that, then we need to find a mechanism whereby instead of reproducing independently, if an individual is in a sparse region, I don't mind them having lots of offspring, but if they're in a densely populated region, I want them to have less reproductive success. And so we introduced a spatial model that kind of does that. So you always want to do roughly what the geneticists do. So we start with a model like theirs. We throw individuals down kind of uniformly across the plane. 
But now, instead of having non-overlapping generations, it's convenient, sorry, uh, yeah, instead of having these discrete generations, it's convenient to have overlapping generations. So I'm going to allow reproduction events to fall according to what we call a Poisson process. And um, as that Poisson process rains down points, rains down reproduction events, they are going to be at specific times, t, but they're also going to specify regions. So they're going to happen in a uniformly distributed way across the plane. And when a, an event falls, it's going to affect only individuals around whatever the declared center of the event is, which is just some uniform pick, and in a ball of radius r around that point. And what do we do when that happens? Well, if when an event happens, there's no individual living in the region that's specified, we don't do anything. There's no reproduction event to take place. But if there is someone in there, then we choose a parent uniformly at random from the individuals living there. And notice that my reproductive success, if I'm living in a crowded region, is low because my chance of being picked as a parent is small because I'm just picking one parent for the event uniformly at random from everyone present. On the other hand, if I'm living in the middle of the Utah desert and there's no one else there, I'm in clover. I'm going to be the parent. So this introduces a regulation of the population. So we choose our parent. I've colored it in magenta. And then each individual in the region dies with some probability. That's just, you know, mortality. And we throw down offspring. But the number of offspring we throw down doesn't depend how many individuals are in the region. It's just a, a Poisson process, so it's just a random variable. And we throw them down independently at random within the region, and they inherit the type of the parent. So in this picture, the magenta ones are the offspring, and um, I, I've killed some of the parental generation. OK. And it turns out that if I allow this, um, if I take this lambda here, this, this random variable declaring how many offspring I throw down to be big enough, it doesn't have to be very big, then actually I get a nice pattern for my population. It looks like Wright and Malico thought their population would look like. It's not Poisson distributed, but it's got a beautiful uniform intensity. It's very nicely behaved. So this model does indeed overcome the pain in the torus that we get a nice regular distribution, which is a godic, which just is a fancy way of saying it will always look like that in the long term. And it's easy to extend this model. We can include natural selection. We can include all sorts of different things, climatic variation. Lots of things can be included. But the downside is that in place of the Kingman coalescent, which was de describing how individuals are related to one another, the expressions in this model are really quite complicated. But it turns out that they're only really complicated in an unnecessary way. And given that the model is so crude, we may as well approximate them by something which is simpler. And so what we do is that we approximate our model by not talking about the individuals living at lots of different points in space, but we appro approximate by a model for what you might call the sampling probabilities, which said, at every point in space and time, I want to know that if you go to that point in space and time and you sample an individual, what's the distribution of its genetic type? What's the probability it's got a particular genetic type? And that's what our model specifies. So... It's kind of fancy at this point because it's all measure value, but don't worry about that because what am I doing? I'm just at every point in space specifying if you were to sample an individual, what's the probability it's got yellow eyes? Okay, good choice. Each reproduction event affects a valid region exactly as we had before. Now the location of a parent is cho chosen uniformly at random from the region because I haven't told you anything about the population where it actually is, so it might as well be uniformly distributed. I choose a type according to the type distribution there, and then I update the type distribution everywhere in the region. And this gives me a well-defined model for the way in which those sampling probabilities evolve with time. Okay, and I can talk then about ancestral lineages, and I'm not gonna write down the formula for you, but actually, ancestral lineages are really easy to describe. If I follow the ancestry of an individual, it doesn't move until it's in the region affected by a reproduction event. And then if the individual it's sitting on is an offspring of the event, it's going to jump to the location of the parent. And so it's actually a rather simple random walk in the plane. And lineages can coalesce when they're hit, the, hit by the same event. So it's a little bit like a Kingman coalescent, except that lineages are now moving around. Okay. And indeed, if we work on a very large torus, for example, and sample individuals uniformly, we recover the Kingman coalescence. Remember, that was true of all our natural populations, so we certainly want it to be true of our model here, that if we sample from far enough apart, we're going to get something that looks like Kingman. 
But I want to show you it also does something that's useful with space. And I promise I'm near the end. So this is actually how we introduce natural selection, but we'll see if we can interpret it in a different way. So if I want to introduce natural selection, let's suppose I've just got two genetic types. Well, now what I'm going to do is when I sample a parent, instead of sampling uniformly at random, which is equivalent to saying if the proportion in the region of little a individuals is W, then that's the probability I choose a, w, I choose a little a parent. Well, now I'm going to weight the choice between the different types. So I'm going to say, well, I'm going to be a little bit more, I'm going to put a little bit more weight on, say, capital A individuals in this example. And um, uh, so I'm slightly more likely, if there are capital A individuals there, I'm slightly more likely to pick them than I am to pick the corresponding little a individuals. And that's just the formula. And here's a simulation. So this is, again, by Jerome. And this is a favoured allele invading a region which was occupied entirely by unfavoured alleles. And all the exciting stuff from the point of view of genetics is happening in this interface here. Okay. But I can interpret that, instead of as a model for selection, I can think that if that S is moderately big, this is quite a good model for range expansion. So instead of thinking of this as being a less fit allele, let's think of it as empty space. And I can model empty space in this way. And then I've got a population expanding into empty space. Now, we don't have very good data on populations expanding into empty space, but it'd be quite fun, wouldn't it, to compare at least to a laboratory experiment. And the first observation will be, well, it's not going to work over small scales, because if I look at what allele frequencies, what frequencies of different genetic types look like under this model, it looks like that. Now, no natural population or laboratory population is going to give me a pattern of allele frequencies that looks like this. It's got sharp edges. It's hopeless. And in fact, very complicated things take place in laboratory populations. So this, I love this photograph. Each little rod is an individual bacterium. Isn't that cool? The camera was very expensive. <laughs> so this is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's a particularly unpleasant bacteria. You don't want it. You find it in the lungs of cystic fibrosis patients, for example. And Kevin Foster, who's in Oxford Life Sciences, um, gave me this picture. I sat on the committee that gave him the camera. Um, and, and this is what the edge of the colony looks like. Right? We're not modeling that. We're really not going to capture the shape, the different shapes of the bacteria and the rods and the way they fold in on each other. That's not what we're getting. But if you look at the same colony at a later time, now, what Kevin did was that he inserted a fluorescence gene into the chromosome of each of these bacteria. And it comes that there, there are two strains. They come up blue and they come up green. And he mixed the two populations together and dropped them at the middle of, middle of a Petri dish at um, time zero, as it were, and then allowed the colony to grow. And what I showed you before was a bit of the edge of the green here. But in fact, you can see that there are patterns emerging over these scales. And these different sectors are actually a kind of proxy for the genealogies. All these individuals probably descended from a single bacterium back here. Okay. So how does our model do? How does our model compare? So we try and do the same thing. Oh, not too bad, is it? So we put down a 50-50 mixture in the middle. And we allowed our population to evolve according to this model, which we call the spatial lambda fleming VO process. Now, you might think that we had to work really, really hard to get this picture to match that picture. But we didn't. We actually had done the simulations before we met Kevin. Um, Kevin's postdoc was a friend of my postdoc. And they sort of compared what they were doing and said, ooh. So fortuitously, we'd chosen blue and green. And the only choice that we had to make beyond that was to get the right number of sectors. And we did have to do some work for that, but it turns out the number of sectors in our model is, is determined by one parameter, which is, or the, you know, roughly, determined by one parameter, which is the radius of the ball that we drop down at time zero divided by the radius of the reproduction events that we use. And this sectoring pattern is absolutely ubiquitous in bacterial populations in labs, apart from E. coli, which swim around in circles. Um, that's what yeast looks like when you grow it on a, a Petri dish, so same sort of thing. So actually, our model seems to be capturing something interesting about how spatial structure interacts with this random genetic drift, so how range expansion and the randomness due to reproduction interact with one another. And so armed with that, we decided to go on and do some mathematics, and uh, many people, including uh, Jono in the audience, in fact, have worked with this model. And um, 
in investigating the interplay between natural selection, spatial structure, uh, the dimension and shape of the domain in which populations involving fluctuating environments, random genetic drift, just trying to understand how those things interplay within our model. I've just given you a list of things that people study in analysis, PDE, and uh, probability theory, and all these things emerge when we're trying to understand the genetics of a population evolving according to this process. And some of them are really pretty. Mean curvature flow is really pretty. So um, I'm going to stop there, but I, I hope, I can't, as I say, do a David Crichton, but I hope that you see why I get very excited when I look at the world through a mathematical lens. Thank you very much. Thanks.